Yeah. Right. Okay. Thanks, uh, Dr. Wang. So today I'm going to talk about diagnosing cardiac amyloidosis, specifically the transthyretin subtype, and we will briefly talk on the treatment options available for our patients in this day and age. These are my disclosures. So diagnosing ATTRCM, as very nicely put by Dr. Loy just now, and non, a non-invasive imaging method has emerged over the past five to 10 years that has sort of uh, supplanted the need to biopsy everyone. So of course, gold standard diagnostic uh, uh, modality is still endomyocardial biopsy. However, as I mentioned, it is an invasive procedure with a risk of complications and very elderly patients, they tend not to agree to undergo invasive uh, treatment and uh, investigations. Of course, the expertise is limited to tertiary centers, and there's a lack of universal access to pathologists, uh, immunohistochemistry, and mass spectrometry. So with the research in the field of uh, scintigraphy, uh, again, as uh, presented by Dr. Loy, if we select the right patients, we can actually get very, very good uh, specificity as well as uh, positive predictive value. Another publication uh, shown here in circulation looked at 1,200 patients evaluated for uh, possible cardiac amyloidosis. Once you exclude light chain disease, a positive scan is as good as endomyocardial biopsy at the end of the day for the diagnosis of ATTR amyloidosis. And this uh, scintigraphy uh, uh, modality has made it to prime time for the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis, specifically the ATTR subtype. So there are many societies which have gone uh, to publish uh, guidelines and flow charts for the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis ATTR subtype. And this was uh, also published in our local journal, the Annals Academy of Medicine uh, by our group. Basically, what it tries to do is to break it into three simple steps. The first step, of course, is to suspect. If you do not suspect the patient of having uh, transdiarrhea amyloid cardiomyopathy, they will never be put through this algorithm. So suspicion, I mean by clinical history, uh, echo findings, cardiac MRI findings, and uh, electrocardiography. So once you have an index of suspicion and the patient fits the phenotype, fits the imaging findings, then we can put them through this algorithm to make sure that they do or they do not have transdiarrhea amyloid cardiomyopathy. Step two would be to rule out light chain disease. Remember, light chain disease is still more common cause of cardiac amyloidosis. Although there's a lot of focus on transdiarrhea disease, but light chain is still about 60% of all cardiac amyloid cases. And after we rule out light chain disease by using serum light chain screen as well as urine light chain screen, then we can move on to technician-based uh, amyloid imaging. In the local setting, we use uh, PYP, as Dr. Loy mentioned. And if the technician-based amyloid uh, imaging is uh, positive or strongly suggestive, in the setting of a negative light chain screen, we are good to call it transdiarrhea cardiac amyloidosis. The patient does not need to undergo endomyocardial biopsy. So then when is... Oh, sorry. So then we go on to one patient that uh, I managed uh, not too long ago, a simple case study. This is an 89-year-old patient who is very active and very mobile, long history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, but starting to develop heart failure symptoms. If you look at the ECG, there was none of all the classical teaching of cardiac amyloidosis. The QRS complexes are big. There was uh, no loss of R waves in the anterior leads. But if we look at the echo, the LV walls are thick and there was uh, apical sparing on strain imaging. So this patient, step two, after suspecting amyloid cardiomyopathy, we put him through the uh, light chain screen with a myeloma screening panel from the serum as well as a urine myeloma study. Both turned out negative for any light chain disease. And finally, he went through a cardiac uh, scintigraphy with a technician PYP scan and it was strongly positive for transdiarrhea cardiomyopathy, and he was started on treatment for, uh, with the Femidis. So this patient did not, in his diagnostic journey, undergo anything invasive, and that is uh, very, very acceptable for someone who was 80-something years old. But then sometimes we cannot run away from the need uh, to biopsy a patient. Then when do we biopsy the, 
uh, in, in the diagnostic, uh, you know, algorithm. So if the patient has a negative PYP scan, but we still strongly suspect transdirecting cardiac amyloid, uh, you know, cardiac amyloidosis, then we might need to biopsy the patient. Or if the patient has a high suspicion of light chain disease, for example, he has very deranged uh, serum light chain screen, but all the other organs that we biopsy, the bone marrow, the fat pad, the rectum, did not show any uh, amyloid uh, proteins, we might have to go to the heart to try to uh, look for amyloid proteins to justify starting of the treatment uh, options that Dr. Sanjay talked about just now. Of course, you know, in the setting of a discrepant light chain and scintigraphy findings, the biopsy would be the uh, tiebreaker. And of course, in patients with suspected amyloid uh, cardiomyopathy who already has existing plasma cell dysplasia, such as uh, monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance, we need uh, tissue biopsy to prove there is or there isn't amyloid proteins. And of course, in patients with suspected amyloid uh, cardiomyopathy, if they are getting an implanted cardiac device anyway, such as a pacemaker or an ICD, we can easily at the same setting do a cardiac biopsy to definitively find out the underlying problem. So as mentioned by my other speakers, the classical finding of cardiac amyloidosis on uh, Congo red stain would be the apple green birefringence. But of course, if we look at just plain OH and E stain, we can already see some hyalinized material in between the cardiomyocyte, which was uh, mentioned by Dr. Chai Ping. It's actually extracellular deposits. There is a special stain that our, uh, our, our pathologists use called the amyloid P protein stain that can actually highlight the extracellular collection of these proteins. At this point, we have diagnosed a patient with cardiac amyloidosis, but unfortunately, we have not subtyped the amyloid protein. Often, we need to send them either for immunohistochemistry or for mass spectrometry. For in this case, the patient underwent mass spectrometry of the tissue that we biopsied, and there was a confirmation of a transdiretin type amyloid deposition. So now we know that making the diagnosis of transdiretin amyloid cardiomyopathy makes a difference to the patient because of the options of treatment these days. In the past, it was thought that the patient would die with the disease, not because of the disease, because it's a senile uh, degeneration of the proteins. But thinking has changed. We are starting to diagnose patients with transdiretin amyloid cardiomyopathy earlier, and they do have worse prognosis even when they are diagnosed in a later age. Number one, as cardiologists, we shouldn't just focus on the transdiretin amyloidosis that we diagnose. We must still look at the overall cardiac uh, uh, status of the patient. Very commonly, the patients have persistent volume overload. They have symptoms, they have late edema, and we need to keep their volume under control to relieve their symptoms. Usually, we use a combination of spironolactone and loop diuretics. Patients are also very intolerant of uh, rhythm disorders because of very restrictive LV filling. So if possible, we can keep the patients in sinus rhythm. If not, if we need something for rate control, you know, it's better for us to use amiodarone rather than digoxin or beta blockers because digoxin in some small studies have been shown to increase uh, erythmogenicity. Beta blockers, they are uh, negative inotropes. And for someone with a very stiff LV, they might require a higher rate to generate the cardiac output. So lowering their rate, reducing their inotropy might not be such a good idea. And of course, in patients with uh, AV nodal disease, they are very, very symptomatic from their inappropriately low heart rate. Pacing would be a very good uh, method to improve their symptoms. Of course, with General symptom control, it doesn't affect the um, disease progression. Nowadays, we have disease-modifying drugs which targets the transdiretin amyloidosis disease pro process at different checkpoints. We can target the production site, which is the liver, or we can stabilize the TTR tetramere and prevent their misfolding into amyloid fibrils. There is also thinking that we can remove the fibrils from the end organs in order to reverse the damage caused. So disease-specific uh, treatment or disease-modifying treatment, the availability really depends on the uh, phenotype. 
if the patient has predominantly neuropathy, uh, neuromuscular disease, then there are many other options for them. Besides the families, they have RNA-based uh, therapies such as patisserin or enotocin. This was studied predominantly in the familial amyloid neuropathy, polyneuropathy group. We often lag behind the neurologist in treating uh, uh, amyloidosis. So we currently only have the famidis, which is a fibril stabilizer for use in patients with predominantly cardiomyopathy uh, manifestation. For wild type, patients generally are more troubled by volume status, by cardiomyopathy rather than peripheral neuropathy. Tofamidis is the only option for them, unfortunately. Of course, there are some other medications that can be used off-label. Uh, flu uh, Diflunisol is uh, one of them. It's actually an end state and it's believed to act the same way as tofamidis. We do use it sometimes for patients who are unable to afford tofamidis. So the um, landmark trial for transthyretin amyloid cardiomyopathy treatment is actually this. Uh, this is the ATTR ACT trial. Some people call it the ATTRACT trial. It studied about 400 patients uh, with uh, transthyretin amyloid cardiomyopathy, both hereditary as well as wild type. They divided them into uh, two doses of the families as well as a placebo. Patients must have had symptoms of heart failure prior to enrollment. And we can see that although initial you know, data was a bit uh, disappointing, if we persist treatment up to 18 months and beyond, the Tafamidis group actually had a statistically um, significant improvement in all-cause mortality compared to placebo. The first 18 months, there was no difference, but the slope of decline actually improved after prolonging the treatment beyond 18 months. Although the mortality only showed up later on, the symptom improvement in the, in, in the form of six-minute walk test, as well as uh, symptomatic uh, you know, uh, quality of life scoring, up to even as early as three to six months, there is already a split in the curves. But do note that there is no regression of symptoms. Patients continue to progress despite the families, but the rate of progression is a lot better if you take tafamidis compared with the patient received placebo. Of course, um, tafamidis is the only approved FDA and the Singapore HSA approved treatment for transthyretin amyloid cardiomyopathy. There are some new drugs uh, in the pipeline. Going back to the success of the treatment of uh, amyloid polyneuropathy, the RNA silencers have been studied currently undergoing trial in cardiomyopathy patients. Of course, liver transplant, we mentioned in the first session, is useful in patients with transthyretin uh, hereditary uh, ATTR with uh, minimal cardiac involvement. Of course, adjunctive therapies of label use diflunisol we talked about. Doxycycline has been shown to remove fibrils in a small study, and some people even use green tea abstract uh, for patients who cannot use uh, tafamidis. So in conclusion, the use of technician-based integraphy has allowed us to diagnose ATTRCM non-invasively, which is a lot more palatable to elderly patients uh, who have the disease. But remember, we always need to first rule out AL amyloidosis, which is the most common uh, form of amyloidosis affecting the heart. Endomyocardial biopsy is still the gold standard and can be used as a tiebreaker in patients with uh, conflicting light chain and scintigraphy results. Accurate diagnosis is important because now there's specific treatment for ATTRCM. Other modalities useful in uh, familial amyloid polyneuropathy are now under trial. And uh, cardiologists, of course, play very important roles in managing symptoms in ATTRCM patients, regardless whether if they are on disease-modifying treatments or not. So with that, I thank you for your attention.